second cold. Welcome to our second golden lecture of the term. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Mike Zimmer tonight. Mike has served on the faculty um, of economics at the University of Evansville since 1976 until his retirement in May 2017. His primary research has centered on labor market outcomes and their relationships to individual decision making. This has included studies of the influence of self-selection and latent or unobservable variables affecting individuals' decisions, such as whether to participate in the labor market, to migrate, to marry, or to dissolve marriages. These decisions have been modeled in the context of their effects on individuals' earnings, or the reverse effect of individual earnings on those decisions. Mike's research has been published in a variety of academic journals, including the Journal of Regional Science, the Journal of Population Economics, Papers in Regional Science, Economic Inquiry, the Journal of Human Resources, Contemporary Economic Policy, Southern Economic Journal, and the Journal of Accounting and Public Policy, among others. So please join me in welcoming him. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for your attendance tonight. I'm a little apprehensive about the intrusion of social science into this uh, lecture series, uh, given its uh, history, but uh, I appreciate the chance to participate. What is a particular thrill tonight is the chance to be here with uh, Bob Stepsis and Nancy Fasano. Uh, for you students who don't know, uh, Dr. Stepsis was principal of Harlexton College. I believe, Bob, 1992 until 2002, right? Fall of 02. Um, and, and of course, as we well know, every principal has a co uh, Nancy. And so uh, these two people had, came here with a great vision, and they were willing to make the tough decisions to make that come true. I believe uh, this is where the British Studies, Bob, they just had exam one. I believe this is where the British Studies program was born. Uh, and so it's a thrill. Uh, what you students will, uh, well, it's a thrill to be on my end. Uh, but the, but the, boot, the boot camp mentality is a very healthy thing. It doesn't hurt, it doesn't hurt the little darlings at all to, to all participate in the same thing. Uh, but what you, uh, what, what you youngsters, and I appreciate your attendance tonight. You got other things to do on a night like this, having come in from a long weekend. Uh, but I think what you'll learn is what I learned from Bob and Nancy, and that is that great things don't just happen. Great things come from great people with a vision, courage to make tough decisions when those decisions aren't popular with everyone. And uh, I'm just a great admirer. Thank you all for everything you've done. I wish you students afterwards would have a chance to say hello and tell them how you did on your exam. <laughs> <laughs> Bob and Nancy, you'd be uh, pleased to know that, uh, and you know Jerry and Patty well, but you'd be pleased to know what great hands this program is in. It is like no other in American higher education. It cannot be matched. Here we are 46 years on, and I'm guessing in my head we've got about 15,000 alumni probably, and they, they owe a great debt to the vision and, and the courage, and uh, we feel so good with Jerry and Patty on board. I'm also pleased to have Bob and Mary Brownlow. The things, don't, things work very well here at Harlexton, and one of the things that's so impressive is the Meet a Family program. Bob and Mary, uh, up here in the front row, have been dedicated to that program for, can you all tell me how many years? Is it 30? 30 years of Meet a Family, 30 years. So I hope you students will maybe say hello to them as well. Uh, it's such a thrill for me to have you here and uh, to be in, in the audience tonight. My remarks tonight are based on a very simple premise, and it's one of the most widely documented uh, results in all of the social sciences, and that is the effect of an advanced education on the individual's earnings, lifetime. We know that education enhances earnings, and this evidence has been brought forth in all sorts of studies over many, many countries, and it endures. It endures over time. In fact, the recent evidence we have is that the earnings gap, the advantage of having a college degree over a high school education or less, that discrepancy has been growing in the past couple of decades, and that is indirectly related to what I want to speak to you about tonight. 
we have access, I say we, my collaborator and I, co-author, have access to an extraordinarily rich resource in data from Sweden, which I will dwell on a little bit later. But what we managed to do with the Swedish data is to trace this thing a little bit farther back into youth and then a, far, a little bit farther out into adulthood, what the effects of education are. In particular, because the data are so rich, we can trace a youngster back to the age of 15. That's an important age in Sweden because school is compulsory in that country up to age 15. There are no decisions to be made about whether or not to be in school, so it's a, to a social scientist, it's a perfect control. Decisions aren't made, they're trapped, the students are in compulsory education. So we get a chance with the Swedish data to look at that and then to look at their education outcomes and then to look, what I want to focus on tonight, is their eventual matching in marriage as far as the selection of spouses and see if there's a link up from youth grades up to the type of spouse an individual marries. It turns out there is one. I think it's pretty fascinating. But I just wanted to uh, issue a caveat with this. And that is that the, the general state of marriage is declining in Western societies. So there is a decline in this marriage rate uh, in favor of either cohabitation in an unmarried state or no marriage at all, no, no partnership at all. And so in the context of my remarks tonight, I'm restricting myself to the, to the marriage act or cohabitation itself. So a little bit of a qualification. The, the decline of marriage is another subject and a fascinating one, but not for tonight. I don't know much about it, uh, to speak to you about it. This is current research, by the way. In fact, what I'm going to discuss with you tonight is something I've completed since I've arrived at Harlexton. So what happens in our business, for those of you who don't know, is that we perform some research and compile a, a written paper, a manuscript. We submit it for review to academic journals, and most of the time they tell us we're no good. And they tell us, just take this thing and throw it in the nearest bin. But this one in particular has been returned to us for a revision with a bunch of demands. And so subject to those revisions, we'll send it back. And I don't know, I can't promise you that what I'm going to tell you tonight won't end up in a bin somewhere. Uh, I just thought I'd rather do current than speak about something that's five or six years old. that has been in print a few years. If it does end up rejected, it will not be a novel experience for me. <laughs> I've been turned down more times than a duvet. Uh, so, you know, it's not, I mean, it's, but, but I hope I, I wouldn't want to waste your time on something that doesn't come to fruition. I, it, the reason it's an important topic, which I'll come back to later, is this issue that some of you have read about called income inequality. In countries around the world, what we're witnessing statistically is a, a sort of a partitioning of the population into individuals and households who have higher incomes, and then lower incomes at the other end. So it is thought to be socially unstable. And I want to draw a link between income inequality and the other topic, the marriage formation idea with you uh, by the end of the talk. One thing I'll note about the income equality, which links into my remarks later, is that we only see it, if you look at the data, we only see it in the prosperous countries, the more wealthy countries, in the so-called third world countries, developing countries. You don't see much because everybody's poor. And so you don't get a chance to see that, that uh, polarization of earned incomes in the economy. So social scientists have studied marriage matching. And what I mean by that is characteristics of spouses that they might have in common. They've studied this forever. It goes back 60 or 70 years, especially in the sociology literature. And it has focused on things like uh, similarities such as race and ethnicity. Most individuals tend to marry somewhere close to their own ethnic group. Most individuals tend to marry fairly close in age, not too far apart. Uh, Hugh Hefner, perhaps, the, the late Hugh Hefner, perhaps the exception there. Uh, and even, e there's even a lo loose uh, correlation between spouses' heights. So all of these things are pretty well known. Uh, that research is pretty well accepted. But what do we say when we get to something like spouses' educations, their completed educations, or how much they earn in income in their professions, their occupations? What about their wages and earnings? 
And there, I, I've always thought that the literature was heavily flawed because if we look at things like completed education and earnings, we're entangling the marriage matching process itself. That is what was present there when the two formed a union versus what is accomplished afterwards. You know, in many cases, I think it's possible for spouses with mutual encouragement to further uh, one or the other's education. It is possible for spouses to cooperate in some way and have both of them earn greater incomes after marriage. It's not hard to imagine. A young couple gets married and decides, well, we want to purchase a house. We don't have a down payment. So we'll both work a lot of extra overtime and try to pile up some money for a down payment to buy a house. So in trot the social scientists and they say, well, these two are making a lot of money together. That must have been why they matched in the first place. And it's, it's simply flawed. So the question is, how do you solve that problem? And the answer is you don't, unless you have a wonderful data set like they do in Sweden. The Swedish government, as some of you might know, tracks every single citizen from, from birth to death. When they're born, they receive a person number. Many Swedes despise the number because it goes into the record of everything. It tracks what we call longitudinally, every citizen. And so we know everything about them. We know school grades. We know things like earnings and occupations. We know criminal records. We know health histories. You have virtually everything on every Swedish citizen and is, it is somewhat unique in the world. I think it is common in a couple of other Nordic countries. I know they have them in Denmark. They have, they're called the population registers. Uh, they have them in Norway. I think possibly Finland. But the only ones I've ever had access to through colleagues were at, uh, in the Swedish system at, uh, with colleagues at Umeå University. That is a sort of a middle tier university in the north of Sweden. So I've had the pleasure of being able to go out there and work with them on, on various occasions. So the question is, how do we do this? What we do with the, our sample of data is go into the population registers and we selected a group of married people ages 30 through 32. And we did this as of, let's see what the, uh, we did this as of individuals born in 1974 in 1976. So by the time we came back to see them, uh, we, ca we caught them in 2006 at ages 30 through 32. So we've got 90,538 people in this sample, but they're married. So 40, roughly 45,000 men, 45,000 women. We know that they're married to each other. And what we do then is we take them and split them apart and we back them up in time. Since we can follow them every year, we back each one back up to the age of 15. And then what we do is measure characteristics about them and their families at age 15. Again, as I noted, they have to be in school at that age. So we're not contaminating this research design with any decision they made to be in or out of school. There was no decision to be made. And so what we do then is try to answer the question. Is there anything you can measure about a youngster at age 15 that tells us what her or his spouse will look like? At, I don't mean physically. Will look like education-wise at the age of 30 or 32. So where does Back to the Future come from, the 1985 movie? Um, I, I'm not going to say too much about it. I'm hoping we get some of our students to, I hope we get some of our students to fetch it. I'll bet you we've got it uh, for them to look at, starring Michael J. Fox as uh, the fictionary, fiction, fictitious, I mean, Marty McFly. He's a teenager in California in 1985. His uh, parents have, uh, I guess, some typical sort of family problems going on. Uh, he comes to meet the, uh, the curious, curiously interesting scientist, Emmett Brown, who has invented a time machine in the form of a re-engineered DeLorean automobile. And uh, Dr. Brown sends Michael J. Fox, I don't want to give away too much of the plot, but what he does is send Michael J. Fox back 30 years and plops him right in the middle of his parents' high school before they were married. In fact, before they had even really made each other's acquaintance. And so Michael J. Fox uh, finds out that his mother 
has drawn the affections of the magnificently repulsive Biff Tannen. And uh, so, not, again, not to give away plot, as the story goes along, some events take place that make Michael realize, or Marty, I should say, Marty McFly, make him realize that, in fact, actions he has taken might actually steer the parents apart. And if they never marry, his existence is wiped from the face of the earth. Or perhaps worse, he might become the prodigy and live his life be, as the, the progeny, I should say, of Biff Tannen. And so the, the idea in the movie is he gets them back together successfully, he returns back to his 1985. And so that's what we are doing with our Swedish teenagers. We, we, what we are doing with them is, in effect, statistically speaking, we are putting them in a De 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 DeLorean and backing them up in time. We tried a subset here of this sample and uh, we restricted it even to teenagers who were living in different parishes. A parish is a small geographic entity in the Swedish census so that they weren't even living in the same neighborhoods, but the, the statistical results were the same. So we're, we're back to the full sample. What we have here, what I've got in two columns, out of each individual, we know all a list of things about them at age 16, and then we know just three things about them at ages 30 through 32. Out of the age 16, you see we know obviously the gender, we know their family's background as far as income, we know what their school grade rank is on compulsory exams that they take. We decided to rank them by quartile. So a quartile is a 25% cutoff in the grade distribution. If a student scores in the top 25%, then he is in the top quartile. If he scores in the lowest 25%, he or she is in the bottom quartile, and so on. We actually have a continuous grade measure but it was a little cumbersome to work with in our modeling, so we decided ranks by quartile. The results didn't change if we went continuously or by rank. But then we know, uh, well, we also know whether the father has a university degree or the mother has a university degree. I think I'm lacking a question mark there. There is a question that we ask uh, in the data. And then we know uh, the region of Sweden. There are eight of them, according to the Swedish census. And we think we need to account for that because there could be cultural differences across those regions with respect to marriage formation and those kinds of processes. So we account for the region they grew up in. And finally, do they live in a large so-called labor market area? I'll come back to the labor market area in a moment, but this is, the, this is what got us into the project in the first place. A labor market area is another geographic division defined not by us, but by the Swedish census. I think the country is divided into some 85 or 90 uh, labor market areas. But I, if I could, using with this data uh, list displayed in front of you, if I could speak the arcane language of econometrics just for a minute. What we try to do here is, is construct a statistical, a mathematical model of the three outcomes on the right. The three outcomes that you see on the right Number one, does the individual himself at age 32 have a university degree? Number two, does his eventual spouse, whoever that is, is, is she or he going to have a university degree by the time the individual is age 32? And then finally, has, is the couple residing in a large labor market area as, as opposed to a more rural area? So the outcomes are the objectives of the research and we're trying to explain them in the model completely by the variables on the left. In other words, we didn't use anything past the age of 15 to try to, I had to talk my colleagues uh, into this. We, we use nothing past the age of 15 in order to try to predict these things. And so the other thing we try to do is in the language of econometrics, we estimate these three outcomes jointly so that we can take advantage in a subtle way of inter, interrelations between them, what econometricians call covariances. So we, we take advantage of that. And the result of that, our reward for that, may be nothing if they reject us, but, but our reward for that is we can take those models afterwards and we can invent an imaginary 15-year-old. And based on the models, we can compute a probability 
First of all, that she will herself have a university degree at age 32. I won't dwell into that much tonight in, because of time constraints. The second thing we can predict is will her eventual spouse have a university degree based on her teenage characteristics and those of her family? And then the third one is the migration, the movement to a large labor market area. Now, as far as the labor market area, this is of special concern in Sweden. This is a map of the country divided by counties, and what you see in the red is what they call middle size. These are medium populated labor market areas. The ones in the dark blue are the heavy ones. These are the most densely populated. The one you see on the east coast is the Stockholm region. The one on the south, just bordering with Denmark, is Malmo. And the one on the west coast there is Gothenburg. And so if you put those three together, they account for about 20% of Sweden's 10 million population. Then you have the white, which is the, the smaller labor market areas, less densely populated. And the very light blue you see in a couple of spots, those are bodies of water. Those don't have much to do with <laughs> Those don't have much to do with, uh, uh, you can fall in them and get wet, but other than that, I, I don't think they're, they're not germane to us. So what the Swedish government is concerned about, and, and this, was, this is what got us started in the first place, what they're concerned about is that if young people earn degrees and then they tend to seek jobs and careers in the large labor market areas, Sweden is in a bit of trouble because of the geography of those areas. They're not dispersed. So what you'll get is what's called a brain drain out of the north. And you'll get an inequality of income not only across education classes, but also geographically. So it is geographically unstable. It is socially unstable from an education standpoint. And that is what got us started on this whole thing in the first place. I think there are some other countries that might share these characteristics. The, the one that comes immediately up to mind to me is Canada, where you have a tremendous concentration of uh, population and, and industry and business all along the southern border. I would say Scotland it comes to mind, but Scotland doesn't fit it quite as well because on the northeast coast there's Aberdeen, which is a very vibrant, and possibly Inverness as well. So it's not quite as extreme as you see in Sweden. But my guess is Sweden is not the only country that experiences this, uh, this enormous challenge. Okay, so what we do, we use the models to take an imaginary individual and we're going to compute probabilities of the three adult outcomes, but in the interest of time tonight, I will not dwell on the individual herself achieving a college degree. That's all in the paper. I'd rather focus more on the spouse, the future spouse, for the, the spouse matching. And then, if time permits at all, uh, the labor market area, the location decision. Uh, feel free, of course, as we go here, we're going to look at the, the probabilities that are, I'll read some of these to you if they're less visible from the back of the room. There are merits to sitting in front, by the way. Uh, you know, it's a... But, uh, I'll read these off to you and try to give you at least the basic message, but please feel free to interrupt me with any questions. I've just been studying them myself. As I say, they're only, uh, they're only days old for me. And so I'm still getting a little bit used to them, uh, perusing them. And they haven't gone back to the journal yet. But I think if you take a look, here is what we've done. For students in my introductory statistics class, first of all, bless your hearts for coming. You had, you've already had statistics class today. All of this is based on the normal probability distribution, which coincidentally you were just introduced to today, this morning. Uh, but it, it is also uh, based on conditional probability. Here's the way the table reads. If we focus on the upper left-hand region solely, and you look across the heading, what we're doing first is we're inventing an imaginary teenager at age 16 who is residing outside of the large blue, dark blue labor market areas, Stockholm, Malmö, or Gothenburg. Secondly, we're dividing that group in, up into both parent pairs possess university degrees. In other words, this will, let's take a young man, for example, and the young man has both of his parents possess a university degree when he was 16 years old. His future wife, both of her parents, will have possessed university degrees when she was 15 years old, and he is in the highest quartile 
of his class. That is Q4. So you're reading in the upper left-hand corner. What the model says is that that young man has a, and by the way, we social scientists express uh, probabilities in decimal form. So uh, not integer form. So you would read that as an 86.8, about 87% chance that that young man will have a, uh, remember we're in the male column now. So that's a young man and there's an 87% chance rounded that his eventual spouse will also uh, possess a university degree. If we drop him to the first quartile, he scores in the lowest 25%. If you go straight down, now you're reading vertically down, you'll see that that probability drops by a whopping 40 percentage points. Now he is only 41% rounded, uh, has a probability of 41% of marrying a spouse with a university degree. If we go next over, so the first thing we learn is that grades matter. They matter in a great, uh, very important way. If we go to the next column, we find the similar computation for females. But if you'll look, the female probability is lower in both respects. I'm, I don't know why. But females have a lower probability of marrying in that, a spouse in that top quartile um, by a, a non, it's not a negligible amount there. So within that cell, what I'm saying is we do get gender differences and we do get definitely get grade differences. So now we'll switch to the next box, moving to your right. And this is both parents without university degrees. So neither of the parents on either side, none of the four, has a university degree. And you can see here how those probabilities begin to tail off. So a young man scoring in the highest quartile without parent, degreed parents has now a 68% chance, that's almost 20 percentage points less of marrying a female in the highest, or with a university degree, excuse me. And so what we're seeing is that parental background makes a big difference too. Grades matter, gender matters, parental background matters. If you go farther to the right, now what you'll find, and again, once again, in that box that we were just looking at, for reasons I cannot explain to you, the female probabilities are lower. A female without degreed parents who scores in the lowest quartile of her high school class has only a 87 chance, seven, 87 and, and 1,000. The probability is 87 out of 1,000. So out of 1,000 such females, we'll see approximately 87. Uh, who will marry a, a man, a male, with a university degree. Now, the right-hand side of the table is a, an exact repetition, but now we're looking at youngsters who, in their teenage years, lived in the large labor market area. Uh, Stockholm, the Stockholm region, Gothenburg or Malmo. And so, if you'll notice, if you can glance then across that top row, across the white dividing line at the top of the table, you'll see that the entire set of probabilities drifts upward. So there is a higher likelihood based on the region of origin, that's what we call it. There's a higher likelihood of marrying someone with a university degree. I believe they're almost uniformly higher, or am I wrong there? Uh, it looks like if we look at parents, no, I believe I'm wrong. I told you I was just looking at it last few days. If we look at the parents without degrees in the large cities, we see a bit of a tailing off of that probability compared to the parents who were in the rural areas before. So region makes a difference, grades make a difference, parent background makes a difference, and what did I forget, gender makes a difference. It is evidence of, we believe, at least we're gonna argue this, a pretty powerful matching. That's what I think is important to look at is that it's matching at the age of 15 back to the future. None of this is based on anything that takes place after compulsory schooling is over with. So the implication is that there is some sort of marriage formation going on there in terms of ultimate spouse at a very young age. A very young age. Age is younger than our students, obviously, than our students who are here. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's already taken place somehow uh, based on this evidence. Now Sweden itself, you understand the caveat here Sweden is not a big country population-wise, only 10 million people. It's very large area-wise, not big population-wise. So 
whether you could extrapolate these to other societies is just an unknown. You, uh, this business is not completely noble. You chase the data and you, you go where the rich data are and try to draw your conclusions from that. If I could just refer, and then I'll wrap it up, if I could just refer then to the bottom part of the table. This is the location problem that the Swedish government is most curious uh, about, and I don't exactly know how they're going to solve it, but if you look at the probabilities of locating, and I'll state this a little more briefly, if you look at the probabilities of locating in those major metropolitan areas, let's look, for example, let's go back to the male with both parents degreed, who scores in the upper 25%, his probability of locating, and remember, he started outside. So this is the migrant we're talking about. He started in the smaller rural areas, but both of his parents out there have degrees. He scores high in his high school class. He has about a 65% chance of moving to the large urban area. On the other hand, if he scores low, if he scores in the first quartile, that probability drops all the way down to 32%. That's how you read the table. You can see that the gender uh, probabilities here are very close all the way across the board. There isn't much gender effect here, the way I'm reading it, for locating in the large areas. And then the only other thing I'll say is you have a situation here where if, the, if you look at the lower right-hand quadrant of the table, these are youngsters who were raised in the first place at age 16 in the large population areas. And if you look closely, you'll see a general upward drift. that They tend to stay they tend to, well, actually, this is actually migrating. This is the probability of migrating to one of the other large areas uh, as opposed to the one they were born in. So in any case, uh, we're, we're going to argue that, and all of this was, by the way, at the insistence of what we call those pleasant people in our lives called referees. Um, this was at the insistence of a referee wanting to see this. And it turns out, I think it's a good idea. It just, it just took a while. Uh, and uh, so we'll send this back trying to say, well, this is the, these effects are sizable for gender, for grades in school and so on. I hope it adds to the paper. But the problem is that the thing has now ballooned to a monster. It's like 42 pages now. And so that's longer than what they'll publish. And so now I don't know what we're going to do when they, when they write back and say, you got to shorten it now. And, uh, and that's going to happen. So... I've been looking at the manuscript, just I'm, I'm trying to figure out any place words can go. You all would be surprised how often you can do without the word the, T-H-E. <laughs> it is often useless in the English language. So I've, I've been crossing them right and left. Uh, those are the kind of things we're, we're doing right now. Now, what about the income inequality? Okay, if, if the, the evidence here would hold over a number of societies, what you're going to see over time, and I don't think it would take long, it would take just a couple of generations, what you're going to see over time, if you get high academic uh, grading people matching together, they're also going to be high earners matching together. And at the other end, you'll see low earners matching with low earners. So the income inequality that we've been reading about could be, in part, it could be a result and a consequence of marital matching over time. The, sit the population itself sorts itself into high and low. How much of our current income inequality, say in the United States, arises from that is something I don't know. I can't answer it. But certainly the evidence here is that that matching is present. And if so, then the, it may be that in a prosperous society like the United Kingdom, like the United States of America, like Sweden and so on, it could be a natural process over time, an economic evolution into high earners low earners. And um, that's an indirect implication of what we have done here. It's been fun, but it could have an ugly ending. We're just going to find out, I guess. Uh, but I'll be glad to take any questions. I regret here I'm not positioned by the door. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't. I, I don't think they open, so. But I'll be glad to. Notice I say listen. I'll be glad to listen to uh, any questions anybody has. Yes, David. I don't. I don't. It's lower than here. Um, and it's lower than the United States. Um, no, I'm sorry. I could, I could lie to you and make up something. Okay. 
Yeah. And, and the third piece of this that I didn't comment on tonight, just in the interest of time, was the individual, himself or herself, earning a degree. I know the way it is in the U.S., though, certainly at the University of Evansville, uh, we are evolving into a majority female population in many universities. And uh, furthermore, the females are beginning to branch out to major fields of study, including economics, that they used to avoid like the plague. So females are not only attending, but they're beginning to diversify their skill set. It could be, Claudia, I don't have that kind of background on them. Yes, Penny. Yes, um, this is fascinating. Uh, so, Sweden, do they want people to move out of the heavily populated areas? Is that well, they're having entire towns deserted. And what the, the descriptive evidence they gave us is that a lot of that migration from north to south is female. So you're having a bunch of young males in the northern counties working in the lumbering industry and the manual trades and those things, and, and, and no females. So you're getting almost into, you're getting into a big imbalance of available marriage partners in the northern part of Sweden and a, and a relative surplus of females in the south because ladies don't want to be loggers. They want to move to Stockholm and go into accounting or, or finance or something like that. So that's their concern. Um, I wasn't too crazy about getting into the topic. I did it as a favor to some colleagues, but it was an acquired taste. It, I became more interested in this as I went along. But that's the, I mean, in, in a free society, that's what you're going to have. And I guess you then put up with whatever population imbalances ensue out of that. But again, Sweden's problem is so unique in the sense that it, that's all southern movement. In the United States, that is scattered all over the place. So you don't have a geographic concentration of high earners. I, mean, I don't think it's a problem in the UK. I mean, you have Manchester, you have the great, you have the Yorkshire, which is, my impression is coming back as a high finance area. And the, the UK's uh, human capital skills, as we call them, seem to be widely dispersed. I know London dominates, but UK is nothing like Sweden. So it's gonna happen in a country like that. It, I, I think it's probably because it's cold. You know, it's very, very cold and, and they, there's not much that they wanna stay up in the North for. I mean, on Umeå University, it's not unusual to sit out on the back uh, veranda in the three warm days of the year. I mean, I've been there before on the, on the back of the campus where the dining area is. They have a picnic area. And it's not that unusual to see a moose uh, walking across. You, you see something that looks like a donkey, you know, and you say, what's that donkey doing out here? And they say, no, that's a moose uh, walking across the lake behind the dining area. It's not unusual. Um, so it's very cold. <laughs> and... Uh, and so I, I think they just prefer to go south when they can. Yes, Nicole. I'm sorry, I'll, I'll get to you. Just interested because in the UK, there's, there's been what one might see as a, a sort of artificial um, attempt to change the balance of, of who goes to university. So they're trying to encourage, I mean, hugely trying to encourage people from lower learning areas or from less advantaged, I think is probably the way they say it. Yeah. I mean, in Clare College in Cambridge, where I, where I teach, they have a huge academic program for schools in the east of London, for instance, to try and encourage um, kids to, to engage you with know, the idea of going to Cambridge. Um, I just wonder whether that sort of um, policy, how, how is that going to impact on the end results that, 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 that you're looking at, for instance, because that's a fairly big social change, isn't it? Yes, it will depend on, according to these data, it's going to depend on whether some of those uh, individuals in underserved populations are academically scoring in the high quartiles. Uh, my experience in my academic career has been that I have met some young people who are actually exceptionally bright, but they don't, they don't score well academically. They have other skills. They have manual skills. They have mechanical skills. And I have thought quite a few times that these youngsters would be very good if they, if they followed a vocational type of trade, uh, plumbing or the electrics or whatever, which in the, U in the U.S. pay better than an assistant professor. You know? uh, and so uh, I've always thought that there's a certain mismatch. And I, I don't know if it's good policy to force a youngster 
who's academically underachieving but mechanically skilled, I don't think it's a good idea to force them onto a college campus. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. And what I'd like to do future down the road, I really would like to look at those quartile one students. I'd like to look at them into adulthood. And I would like to study the ones who do a vocational track instead of the university degree. I'd like to trace their success relative to the high quartiles. We just haven't done it yet. I think there are lots of things you can find out. I'm starting to realize now you can find out a lot of things from school grades at 15. I'd like to follow criminal records, health outcomes, uh, uptake of what they call the uptake of social benefits, which are generous in Sweden. I'd like to look at those and contrast them, adult outcomes far removed from marriage. You know, what, I, what else I want to do is, <laughs> my, my co-author won't go along with me. I wanted to take those uh, 46,000 marriages, and I wanted to, using a random number device, I wanted to scramble them and marry them off to other people. And, uh, <laughs> and, then, and then with the false marriages, I wanted to back them up. And I wanted to see how that table compares to this one. But uh, his attitude is, let's do only what they're asking us. You know, they've asked us to do A, B, and C. Let's not toss one of your crazy ideas in there. And, and then they'll send it back for more. So I'm, I'm giving up. I'm not going to do that. But I do think the quartile one population is well worth studying. I don't think quartile one necessarily means you have to be a low earner all your life. I think it means that you may have to adapt to something that's a line of work that's different from from what the academic track is. In, in Germany, for instance, I mean, the apprenticeships and the, and the vocational tra training that, that you're talking about is actually seen as being the equivalent of a university degree. It is seen as being a lower type of, of, of life. And my understanding of the German system is they are tracked at about age 15, aren't they? It's roughly that age. Where, where they choose that vocational track of school. Yeah. So I, somebody had a hand and I, I neglected them. Yes, Bob. Mike, one of, one of the issues would be, even for your electrician, plumber, skilled uh, craftsman, uh, still the best place to live is going to be Stockholm, Gothenburg, and Malmö. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where the business, that's where work is going to be. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, granted all you're saying about the, the possibilities of, of, of nice earnings in uh, the lower quartile, it's not going to solve the relocation problems uh, of, the, of the country. Not unless you do it forcibly, and the last time that was tried was in Siberia right. for the oil fields. I don't think it worked out real well. Uh, but uh, forcible migration has not been, uh, has, has never met with success. Yeah, um, I've learned recently. I've, lear I've learned recently through our travels with Molly the extent, very recently, as in this past weekend, uh, the extent to with which Northern Scotland is emptying out those Northern Islands. It's very remote. Young people are leaving, and uh, there are derelict homes all over those islands of people who just decided it was better to walk away and move south to Glasgow or Edinburgh. Yes, I'm sorry, Nicola, you had to hand it. Yeah, that's, that's why we started here. I hope I'm, I'm hope I'm hearing your question correctly, Nicola. That's why we started with the married couples in the first place. You got 50-50, we forced it. Now, there are all kinds of flaws with that research design. Obviously, you're self-selecting. You are selecting those who married, and you're ignoring those who did not marry. We took that heat from the referees, and we, I don't have an answer for them. That's, uh, that's got to be a different paper. So we're going to try to dance around that. But you're correct. I'm glad you're not my referee. 
Uh, because because yours is yours is worded a little bit more pointedly. That one was was sort of a, I wonder if you'd look into this, and the response is going to be I won't know. We wonder too, and we're not going to do it because yeah. No, but we did we did do it so we have one male, one female, evenly divided. Yeah. <laughs> Beyond the scope of the present study. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to see what happens.